Small Engine Dyno Works. What's up everybody? Welcome to Dirty Elbows Garage. In this video, we are done and wrapping up the dyno project. If you didn't just notice from the clip you just saw, it is off and running, doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Although it looks a little bit different than what we originally set out to do. So, to start things off, I wanna go through the system and talk about what's different, why it changed, and how we got to where we are. Okay, so first thing you're gonna notice is that the hydraulics look a little bit different. You're gonna notice this filter here and this flow control valve. That's not the original one I set out to use. I did have that other one. I assembled the entire system with the other flow control valve and I just couldn't build any pressure with it. I adjusted the relief valve and all I can do is chalk it up to something wrong with the product itself. So instead of taking a risk on another one, I went an alternate route, which is a needle flow control valve now the needle flow control valve is a lot cheaper and it's a lot simpler, but it doesn't have an internal relief system. Um, and so I decided to throw a pressure gauge uh, in line with it as well so that I can keep an eye on my pressure and so I can visually just crank it back if I see a problem. It's a little bit more risky because that's something, something else I have to watch or look out for, but it's simpler, a little bit more foolproof. So when I had to order the new flow control valve, I wanted to get some filtration in the system. Originally, I thought I wouldn't do that, but if you work with hydraulics, you know that filtration is something you can't skip. So to make the system a little bit more robust, I threw in a little bit extra money just for a filter. And honestly, these components together are probably about the cost of that other flow control valve. So it's kind of a wash as far as uh, cost savings there. So as a system overview, We've got the hydraulic reservoir, which is just a bucket. Now, some of these reservoirs, if you just go buy an aluminum or a steel one, they can be pretty expensive, but to save costs, I decided to go with the bucket. I've got my inlet to my pump coming from the port out the side of the bucket. I made sure that this is below the oil level so that my pump is constantly primed and I've got a nice slope here going down to it. I've got, my, uh, I've got an inline filter, then my hose goes to the inlet to the pump, the pump's turned by the engine. We've kind of gone through that before. And then I've got my output of my pump to my flow control valve. Now I crank this shut. As I crank it shut, it builds up pressure and I'm watching that on the gauge. Now the whole system's rated for 3000 PSI. 3000 PSI at the RPM that the engine is turning the pump is, it's a lot more horsepower than this engine can do. So it's not really a concern, something I really need to watch out for. This is if something else happens in the system or if I decide to step up engines or anything like that, I can, I can really watch this and gauge it off of that. But for now, I, it wasn't really a concern with this engine. So I've got my flow control valve. This is a needle flow control valve. It's a lot more simple of a, of a device. And after that, the oil returns back to the reservoir. I've also got my temp gauge in the top of the bucket right here. And that's the hydraulic system. Okay, moving over to the DAC system. Like I've said before, I've got my uh, rotary encoder back here. You'll notice that that moment arm is zip tied to the load cell. This is just to keep it from wobbling around too much. Um, you're clamping it to the load cell, so really, you're, yeah, you're picking up some of the weight of the arm, but I meant to zero that out anyways. Um, the other thing I really had to watch out for when setting this up and kind of fine tuning this were these hoses and how much they wanted to twist the pump as I tightened them down. But I got it really close and then I just used a zero offset to zero my load cell in the data acquisition system on that side. I have a tablet here that I was actually getting the data on and we're gonna go back a in a little bit and kind of review, review the data on that you saw at the beginning of this video. Uh, something else to note is I actually added a piece of duct tape to the rotary encoder. It's not to actually hold the rotary encoder in place. I'm actually using a zip tie for that, but the surface of the rotary encoder is really slick and so even held down with the zip tie against the metal mount, it was one to rotate. It does have a flange face that you can make something for, but it was much easier just to uh, shape a piece of tubing for it to hold and it works just fine. Okay, covering the data acquisition system in a little bit more detail. This load cell is actually available off of Amazon. This is a 20 kilogram one. Um, and there's tons of tutorials of how to apply this and libraries for it, things like that. Same thing goes for the rotary encoder, also available on Amazon. The controller that combines the data is the Arduino Uno. And when we go through the run of data from this video, or from the clip that you just saw, you're gonna see that I'm gathering 
RPM, torque, and I'm outputting horsepower all in the same line of code. In Excel, I know my frequency of data samples and I'm just adding a time value in Excel when I want to start and stop the run. So that's how I'm actually graphing it and looking at the data. On the engine side of things, I did test it with the clutch, completely understanding that that was going to cause me a few issues. Um, it's a it had a centrifugal based clutch, which means as RPMs dip down, the grip that the clutch transfers also dips down. You're fighting two variables there. The RPMs dropping, you're losing grip, meaning you're losing your torque that you can transmit, and it was just really messy data. It's not what I intended to use anyways. I wanted to run it straight off of a, uh, just a sprocket, so I got a different sprocket for it, put it on there, and it's working exactly as I thought it would. Now there's another issue I ran into, and it's something that I expected would happen, but um, I decided to go ahead and risk it because it was easy enough to mitigate anyways. And it's actually a topic I'm gonna cover in a video coming up soon in a completely different project. And what that is is load path. And so what's going on here is that the engine is turning this pump, which builds up the load and causes a lot of tension in the chain. Well, you have a frame here that's holding all of your rotating assembly for the hydraulics and you have the engine on its own mount here. Bridging those two mounts is this wooden tabletop. Now the wooden tabletop is actually what transmits all of, all of the load from this frame to this frame that the chain is seeing. When this engine is fully cooking away, the tabletop is actually flexing due to the chain's tension and it was causing slack in the chain to build up and I had a couple of moments where the chain actually came off. So that was quickly fixed by taking a piece of scrap tubing that I had and I just ran it through two of the bolts and I bridged the two together. That took a lot of flexing out of the wooden tabletop. And one more thing to note about the assembly itself, the engine spins much faster than this pump is rated for. So what I had to do was get a bigger sprocket for the pump than for the engine. Now what that does is that for every, it's two to one gear ratio. So for every two revolutions of the engine, the pump is spinning one time. That means that in the data, you're gonna see an RPM value that's half of what the engine is doing, but you're going to see a torque value that's twice of what the engine is actually doing. Now the horsepower though, horsepower is exactly the same no matter which side of the equation you're looking at because it's combining both RPM and torque and if one of them doubles and one of them halves, you're still gonna get the same result at the end of the day. Okay, so I got a few questions of how to actually spec this system out and the math behind making sure that your pump can handle the correct amount of horsepower when you look at the pressure and the flow rate and uh, just what factors kind of go into selecting some of these things. So heading over to the whiteboard to do a little bit of math. Okay, to cover a little bit of the theory side of the dyno, I've got a little bit of math up here. One side covers the spec of the system and how it was designed, put together, and the other side covers how the DAC system works. So on the right hand side of the equation, I've got the hydraulic layout for power. There's pressure, flow rate, and a conversion factor. On the left hand side, I've got another layout, and this is more generic torque based power, mechanical based power, however you want to say it. And it consists of torque, RPM, and another conversion factor. Now, these conversion factors are independent to this equation based on the units that your pressure flow rate in and your torque and RPM. Basically, uh, my pressure here is in PSI, flow is uh, gallons per minute, and my torque is in foot pounds. So in specking the system, I took flow rate and actually broke it into two new variables, and that would be displacement of my pump and RPM. So taking that into account, I made sure that the engine RPM feeding into the pump wasn't going to exceed what that pump can handle at speed wise. Now combining the displacement of a pump and my max pressure of the pump and the hydraulic system itself, that's how I found my range of horsepower I was going to work within. The left hand side of the equation is more, like I said, more traditional power, mechanical horsepower, um, torque, RPM, and your conversion factor. So torque, foot pounds, like I've talked about before, that's what the moment arm is giving us, and RPM is what the rotary encoder is giving us. 
Now, both sides are equivalent to horsepower. I could measure horsepower over here if I was picking up using a pressure sensor and a flow meter, but both of those, specifically the flow meter, are a little bit more expensive and taking the approach of a budget-based dyno, uh, the route that I've gone to find torque instead is a more cost-effective way to do it. There's a lot of different ways to break that math down. One of the simplest ways is to make a table in Excel or another spreadsheet uh, calculator. And you can kind of manipulate these variables to feed all that information back and forth, make sure it works within the range you're looking for. You can back out a torque to see that your load cell is working in the same range that the rest of your system is as well. Okay, so with that wrapped up, let's give that dyno run one more look and then we'll jump into the data and see what that looks like. Okay, so this is the data from the run that you just saw. On a quick overview of the graph, on my left hand Y axis, you can see my torque and horsepower values. My right hand Y axis, you've got my RPM values. And then my X axis is time in seconds. And I didn't do a whole lot of formatting to the graph, so the zeros don't line up, and I didn't need to go into the negative areas, things like that. But yeah, for now it's going to work. So the rpm you can see a quick spike here from when i tried to start the engine but then went back down to zero and then i start the engine and we're off and cooking as i start closing the valve you can see the pressure is built up and so the torque on the motor starts climbing it climbs 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 it's pretty consistent throughout here there is a couple of waves uh, some of that's from the vibration that the table saw. Definitely over here this is this is also vibration induced how erratic this is the vibration issues are something I still need to address but we'll get to that on a different day. We reach a peak horsepower of about 4 horsepower. Remember this 17, 17 and a half foot pounds of torque is actually half of that so we're looking around 8 and a half or a little bit above that. Um, and as the engine dies, RPM drops to zero, torque falls off and so does my power. Okay so before I wrap up the video I kind of want to cover some expandability of what this dyno can become. And then I wanna talk about the future of some more projects coming up. So something you've probably noticed is this isn't what a dyno looks like on the internet on, on when I put a car on a dyno or a motorcycle on a dyno or something like that. Well, no, it's not because this is a small engine. Small engines typically go up to their peak RPM or their operating RPM and that's where they sit or they're idling. They're not really used like a car or a motorcycle engine is. So, the dyno is typically used with small engines where you crank up the small engine, you get it up to peak RPM, and then you start applying a load. Now you can do that manually. I can't do this to a car or something like that. Well I could, but you're not going to want to take your car, peg it on the rev limiter and just sit there while somebody cranks a valve shut. And the reason how to get around that, and that's something that I could potentially build into this, is a control system that ramps up the engine speed of the engine and the control system watches the torque and the RPM gain and it makes sure that the RPMs continually rise and it only applies enough pressure so that it's extracting the peak power at that point but still letting the RPMs rise. And that's going to be more of a traditional dyno run but what that takes is some feedback controls, things like that. Um, something we could do but for this and the tuning that I plan on doing it's not really necessary. We may get into that, maybe not. The other thing we could do is look into more programming. Right now we're running things purely out of Arduino code. It's open source, easy to find tutorials are all over the place, but you can get a lot fancier with live data graphing and things like that. So that's a potential in the future also, because it'd be a lot nicer to actually see the graph of the horsepower climbing as you start closing the valve, as opposed to watching numbers on a code or something like that. Those are some future additions that could be made to the system just as it sits. But for right now it's, completely what I need it to be moving forward from here. Okay, so that wraps up this video. The few more things, the channel is going to change just a little bit. I'm still going to have some projects that are smaller where I have uh, one, two, maybe three episode projects. And then I'm also going to introduce bigger projects that last dozens of episodes or something like that. Uh, I've got plenty of work to do on the CRX, plenty of work to do on the Rambler, 
I just picked up a C5 Corvette from an auction that needs plenty of help. So in each one of those projects, I'm gonna be looking at design, 3D scanning, analysis, definitely fabrication. Like I said, that wraps up this video. Give us a like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And like always, thanks for watching.